Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Lisa, and I'm here to share some devotionals with all of you. The title is A Great Golf Fixed, and this is part one. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16, verse 15. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Christ shows that in this life men decide their eternal destiny. During probationary time, the grace of God is offered to every soul. But if men waste their opportunities in self-pleasing, they cut themselves off from everlasting life. No after probation will be granted them. By their own choice, they have fixed an impassable gulf between them and their God. This parable draws a contrast between the rich who have not made God their dependence and the poor who have made God their dependence. Christ shows that the time is coming when the position of the two classes will be reversed. Those who are poor in this world's goods, yet who trust in God and are patient in suffering, will one day be exalted above those who now hold the highest positions the world can give, but who have not surrendered their life to God. There was a certain rich man, Christ said, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And that is the end of part one, and now for part two. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Luke 16, verses 19 through 21. The rich man did not belong to the class represented by the unjust judge, who openly declared his disregard for God and man. He claimed to be a son of Abraham. He did not treat the beggar with violence or require him to go away, because the sight of him was disagreeable. If the poor, loathsome specimen of humanity could be con comforted by beholding him as he entered his gates, the rich man was willing that he should remain, but he was selfishly indifferent to the needs of his suffering brother. There were then no hospitals in which the sick might be cared for. The suffering and needy were brought to the notice of those to whom the Lord had entrusted wealth, that they might receive help and sympathy. Thus it was with the beggar and the rich man Lazarus was in great need of help, for he was without friends, home, money, or food, yet he was allowed to remain in this condition day after day, while the wealthy nobleman had every want supplied. The one who was abundantly able to relieve the sufferings of his fellow creature lived to himself, as many live today. There are today close beside us many who are hungry, naked, and homeless, a neglect to impart of our means to these needy, suffering ones places upon us a burden of guilt which we shall one day fear to meet. All covetousness is condemned as idolatry, all selfish indulgence is an offense in God's sight. And that is the end of part two, and now for part three. 
Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, verse 18. God had made the rich man a steward of his means, and it was his duty to attend to just such cases as that of the beggar. The command had been given, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus 19, verse 18 The rich man was a Jew, and he was acquainted with the command of God but he forgot that he was accountable for the use of his entrusted means and capabilities. The Lord's blessings rested upon him abundantly, but he employed them selfishly to honor himself, not his maker. In proportion to his abundance was his obligation to use his gifts for the uplifting of humanity. This was the Lord's command. But the rich man had no thought of his obligation to God. He lent money and took interest for what he loaned, but he returned no interest for what God had lent him. He had knowledge and talents, but did not improve them. Forgetful of his accountability to God, he devoted all his powers to pleasure. Everything with which he was surrounded his round of amusements, the praise and flattery of his friends, ministered to his selfish enjoyment. So engrossed was he in the society of his friends that he lost all sense of his responsibility to cooperate with God in his ministry of mercy. He had opportunity to understand the word of God and to practice its teachings but the pleasure-loving society he chose so occupied his time that he forgot the God of eternity. The time came when a change took place in the condition of the two men. The poor man had suffered day by day, but he had patiently and quietly endured. In the course of time he died and was buried. There was no one to mourn for him but by his patience in suffering, he had witnessed for Christ. He had endured the test of his faith, and at his death he is represented as being carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Lazarus represents the suffering poor who believe in Christ. When the trumpet sounds and all that are in the graves hear Christ's voice and come forth, they will receive their reward, for their faith in God was not a mere theory, but reality. And that is the end of part three, and now for part four. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Luke 16, verses 22 through 24. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. The doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. The Savior knew of their ideas, and he framed his parable so as to inculcate important truths through these preconceived opinions. He held up before his hearers a mirror wherein they might see themselves in their true relation to, to God. 
He used the prevailing opinion to convey the idea he wished to make prominent to all, that no man is valued for his possessions, for all he has belongs to him only as lent by the Lord. A misuse of these gifts will place him below the poorest and most afflicted man who loves God and trusts in him. Christ desires his hearers to understand that it is impossible for men to secure the salvation of the soul after death. Son, Abraham, is represented as answering, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Thus Christ represented the hopelessness of looking for a second probation. This life is the only time given to man in which to prepare for eternity. And that is the end of part four, and now for part five. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. James 4, verse 14. The rich man had not abandoned the idea that he was a child of Abraham, and in his distress he represented a calling upon him for aid. Father Abraham, he prayed, have mercy on me. He did not pray to God, but to Abraham. Thus he showed that he placed Abraham above God, and that he relied on his relationship to Abraham for salvation. The thief on the cross offered his prayer to Christ. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, he said. Luke 23, verse 42. And at once the response came, Verily I say unto thee today, as I hang on the cross in humiliation and suffering, thou shalt be with me in paradise. But the rich man prayed to Abraham, and his petition was not granted. Christ alone is exalted to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 5 verse 31 Neither is there salvation in any other. Acts 4 verse 12 The rich man had spent his life in self-pleasing, and too late, he saw that he had made no provision for eternity. He realized his folly and thought of his brothers who would go on as he had gone, living to please themselves. Then he made the request, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. When the rich man solicited additional evidence for his brothers, he was plainly told that should this evidence be given, they would not be persuaded. His request cast a reflection on God. It was as if the rich man had said, If you had more thoroughly warned me, I should not now be here. Abraham, in his answer to this request, is represented as saying, your brothers have been sufficiently warned. Light has been given them, but they would not see. Truth has been presented to them, but they 
would not hear. And I'm going to end this here, and I will come back to read the rest of these devotionals, parts 6 through 10. I pray you all have a beautiful day in the Lord. God bless each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next video. God bless. Bye-bye.